Welcome back to Montclair Film Story Slam, everybody. How's everybody's Thursday going? Awesome. I'm Jennifer Cambris. I'm the director of production here at Montclair Film. Storytelling is an integral part of Montclair Film, uh, the Montclair Film mission. And although we are happy we are, we are able to do a few of these virtually uh, during the lockdown, there's nothing like giving your attention and energy to a storyteller in person. So thank you all for being here tonight. Come on in, guys. I'm just chatting. Come on in. <laughs> For those of you who have never been to our headquarters here at Cinema 505, welcome. Some of you may know this, but last September, our education concourse downstairs and all of the equipment as well as parts of this theater were destroyed in Hurricane Ida. I wanna give a very big shout out to Michael, our facilities manager, if you could wave your arm, Michael, thank you. And to Zach, our tech manager over here, who've worked tire tirelessly getting the space back up and running so we can finally host events again. We're able to gather, get together tonight because of their hard work. So thank you to Zach and Michael. Before I introduce your host for the night, I have some announcements and housekeeping notes for you. As you can see, the bar is open tonight. Look at our lovely bartenders. I just can't, they're adorable. So feel free to grab a drink in between the speakers and during deliberation. I will tell you social events permits are a pain to fill out. So don't do it for you. Get a drink for me and the time I spent filling out that application. <laughs> As many of you know, we've renovated and are now uh, operating the Claridge Theater across the street, which is a nonprofit. Yeah, let's get a good, I love that. Let's cheers for the Claridge. It's now a nonprofit cinema showing films year round. As a nonprofit film and education organization, we rely on our members to provide us with support. And your membership extends not only to our classes, but to the film festival and our special programs. But it gives us discounts on tickets and concessions year round at the Claridge as well. So thank you to the members for your continued support year round. And if you would like to join us as a member, please visit us at montclairfilm.org. We're currently at the tail end of our summer academy classes. Where Sue? Can you wave? This is our director of education. She's incredible. We are at the tail end. We've had an amazing summer of the summer academy classes, but the fall semester offerings have recently been posted. Montclair film education programs include everything from filmmaking to editing, Photoshop to animation, and even improv and voiceover, and so much more for both kids and adults. Please check out our website to see a full list of offerings and details about registration. For those of you who know any students in cinema in grades 10 through 12, is that right, Sue? We've opened up our applications for the junior jury, which happens during our film festival in October. So any, anybody you know in grades 10 through 12, have them check it out. This year's festival dates will be October 21st to the 30th. If you're interested in becoming a volunteer for the festival, you can come to our information sen uh, session, which I did not write down. I believe it's September 13th. Look at that memory. I think that's the Jazz House Kids event because we love our friends at Jazz House Kids. Um, I think it's September 13th, but you can go to our website and get more information from there. Please know our fire exits are on your left and right and our restrooms are on your left out the exit door. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce your host for the evening, the Montclair Film Storytelling Instructor, Duncan Miller. He is a teacher. Oh, I love this clapping, guys. I'm into it. Just own it. I love it. This is a great Thursday audience. He's a teacher and improviser who's performed and trained with the Second City and Improv Olympic in Chicago. He has a theater degree from Ithaca College and performed at various theaters and festivals in New York City, Chicago, and Baltimore prior to earning his master's degree in education. Currently, he is a teacher at North Star Academy in Newark, where he performs to a sold-out audience of high schoolers every day. Please welcome Duncan Miller. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome, everyone. Sold out on a Thursday. That feels good. I am really excited to be hosting tonight, to be here to guide us through a storytelling journey. We have not been together in person for one of these for two-plus years. We did a few virtually, as Jennifer said, but this is what it's all about. The energy in the room, the real laughter. Thank you for that applause. We are going to build something together tonight, and it'll never happen again. It will be recorded on the website. However, the magic that's going to happen in this room from the generosity of our storytellers and our beautiful audience tonight is going to be something really special. So welcome. Thank you. And if you've never been to a story slam, please raise your hand. Wow. Give yourselves and those veterans, please give them a round of applause. Welcome to your first story slam. All right. We do have to talk about rules. 
Each storyteller will have five minutes. The beautiful Jennifer will be at the back of the room. Storyteller, she is your cue. We don't do Showtime at the Apollo. We don't yank anybody off stage, but please pay attention. The green card will let you know that you're at four and a half minutes. Sorry, four minutes. Yellow, four and a half. And then when you hit that red light, you're at five minutes. Please start wrapping up your story. We have three wonderful judges. They'll have a deliberation afterwards. There will be a winner, but this is a friendly competition. There's actually three ranked winners. So this is a friendly competition for us tonight. I hope you have your beverages and your delicious little snackies from the snack bar. There is no intermission. We're going straight through until deliberation, then we'll have a break time then. All right, I would love to introduce our illustrious judges for the evening. We have three of them, so please, after I introduce them, we'll give them a round of applause. Our first judge is Ian Bo Shim. She's an award-winning film and television producer here in Montclair. Some of her credits include Amend, The Fight for America, six-part series on Netflix, executive produced by Will Smith. When Lambs Become Lions, We Will Rise, Michelle Obama's mission to educate girls around the world. The Oscar-nominated Cartel Land and the notorious Mr. Bout from the Sundance World premiere. Inbo has worked with directors uh, who work across narrative and documentary forms. And notable projects include Remote Control, Rachel Getting Married, and Jimmy Carter, Man from Planes. Let's give Inbo a round of applause, please. All right. Next up is Holly Shakur Fleischer, born and raised in Wayne, New Jersey, not too far, graduated from Tulane University. She moved to Los Angeles after graduating and quickly, quickly rose to become one of Hollywood's top personal publicists. Having worked on major marketing campaigns, such as uh, films such as Black Panther, Superbad, and The Amazing Spider-Man, as well as orchestrating the Oscar campaign for Best Actress, Emma Stone in La La Land, Fleischer's client list uh, includes other notable talent like Michael B. Jordan, Lady Gaga, Nicki Minaj, Jennifer Garner, Sofia Vergara, and Gabrielle Union. In 28, yes, woo. In 2018, Fleischer left the world of publicity to take on a role as Gabrielle Union's producing partner for a production company, I'll Have Another. That sounds appropriate, wonderful. Together, they produced two major motion pictures, Disney Plus, uh, Cheaper by the Dozen, which was released in the spring of this year, and the upcoming romantic comedy, The Perfect Find. And that'll come up the, uh, in the next summer, is that right? Summer? The fall, thank you. <laughs> also on Netflix. She left her position uh, to head back here to New Jersey where she currently resides, so let's give it up for Holly. Thanks for being here. Our third and final judge, Axel Ortiz, is an award-winning filmmaker and artist from Chile with a BFA in filmmaking from Montclair State just up the road. His work has screened internationally and includes short narratives, documentaries, commercials, and a film residency. And he works here with the Montclair Film as the Education Program Coordinator. Let's give it up for Axel. Tonight's theme is victorious. We have all been through it. We are in dire need of celebrating our wins. So tonight we're gonna hear stories of overcoming some obstacles, sharing and reveling in those little moments where we see people come alive and become the victor. Some of these are gonna be storytellers past stories. Some will be current and relevant to today. Regardless, it's going to be a night of exciting stories against systems, against bullies, against life's curveballs. I'm really honored to guide us through this and introduce all of these incredible stories tonight. Let's give it up for our first storyteller. Let's welcome to the stage Carl Kelsch. Hey, so when I was in first grade, I invited this boy from school to come over to my house, and he proceeded to steal a $10 bill from our junk drawer. So in the awkward conversation that ensued between his parents and mine, this kid insisted that I said, point blank, that he could have the money. Now, innocent little first grade me, this is my reaction. Well, I don't remember that, but I guess I might have said that. Well, by fifth grade, not much had changed. I was living in the land of wedgies and spitballs, and I still wasn't very savvy, so my parents enrolled me in Boy Scouts, hoping that I might develop some good, old-fashioned 
G-U-M-P-T-I-O-N. Now, what's that spell? Gumption, yes. And actually, the timing was really good because Troop 205 was just starting off. They met in the basement of the little private school where I went. So some of the same boys that during the day were picking on me or shunning me were actually some of the same dozen kids who started off this troop that were part of my new brotherhood of scouting. And all of a sudden, I was getting my first tastes of like fraternity. And for the first time in my life, I'd say like I felt truly tolerated. <laughs> so the other experience was that as our troop grew, all these newbies are coming in, and suddenly I'm getting to this enjoyment of being like one of the troop elders with all these kids who just automatically respect me because I'm like one or two years older than them, and we're hazing them lightly as they do their paces. So for that reason, I always looked forward to the one, sum one week of every summer that we spent at Boy Scout camp. And these heavily scheduled days of rowing and color wars and knot tying and campfire stories. And I would go back to my tent and I would feel vaguely capable for the first time. But every once in a while, some of the kids still like to put me in my place. And that happened one day when we were coming back from the mess hall. Little Billy Jr., alpha male in training, his dad was Bill Sr., the scoutmaster, of course, decided to call me out that I'd drop the ball on my flag duties. And he was right. He said, where's the troop flag? Didn't you bring it? Did you forget it? And yes, it was my responsibility that day to bring it around to the assemblies. And sure enough, I left it there. And when the scoutmaster echoed the same question, I really turned beet red, and I knew I had to make this right. I went to the dining hall, and I said, you know, does anybody have the flag? It wasn't there. I went down the road to the camp office, to the lost and found. They didn't have it. It started to rain at this point, so I come back to the camp. I don't know how I'm going to show up empty-handed like a wet dog, but I spotted Matthew, this one little new scout, and he always had my back. Well... He came over to me, and I realized that a conspiracy had unfolded. And this conspiracy went all the way to the top because they all knew that after I had walked out of that door with the flag, they got it, rolled it up, and little Billy Jr. stowed it away safely in the equipment tent. And they thought back to the looks on their faces when they sent me on this fool's errand. So Billy uh, Matthew did ninja-style got into that equipment tent, snuck the flag out to me, and then I had to think of my next step. Water. So I stood under the gutter of the nearby cabin until I got dramatically soaking wet, along with the rolled up flag, and that's when I made my triumphant Rocky March entrance right back into the center of the camp with the flag and loudly declared to everyone in earshot, I found our flag, I found our flag and they all start assembling, and I'm relishing this moment hard because those aren't water drops on their forehead from the rain. That's perspiration because they're all sitting there wondering, if he has the troop flag, <laughs> what flag is this that we have in the equipment tent? <laughs> so I'm letting it draw out for a bit, and I know that all I have to do is unveil that flag and show them that it indeed does say Troop 205. But that day that flag might as well have been emblazoned with the capital letters V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. Now, what's that spell? Thank you. All right. Let's keep it going for Carl. Nice job. Thank you so much. One time, I was going to summer camp, and my brother was also there. He is three years older than me. And the kids told me to go find the left-handed smoke shifter for the fire. Doesn't exist. Three hours. Three hours. I feel you, Carl. I'm glad you found yours. All right, we're going to keep it going. Our next storyteller is another veteran to our story slams. Let's give it up for Maria Del Pan. So I am super excited to tell you the story of my graduation speech. It didn't go as planned. 
somehow, when I was back in high school, uh, my classmates at Clifton High elected me class president. And I don't know if it was because of or in spite of my purple hair and Doc Martens, but they chose me for the job, and I loved the job. Uh, and I also loved the fact that it came with the opportunity to give a high school graduation speech in front of thousands of people at the end of the year. It's a big school. Uh, I worked on my speech for months. And then for weeks, my favorite high school English teacher, Mrs. Redstone, helped me uh, work on it some more. And then three vice principals approved the speech. Uh, that was all great until about two days before graduation when I got a call at home from Mrs. Redstone. And she said, um, Maria, are you, are you sitting down? No, um, okay. Uh, well, uh, we need to talk. Uh, I spoke with the principal. He doesn't like your speech. Uh, he, wants you to, he wants you to write a new one. Uh, he wants you to talk about the football team and how helpful the Board of Education has been all year. <laughs> Small problem. I don't really like football. Uh, I, in four years, I'd been to one game, and that was only because my friend Matt was playing, and I'm a supportive friend. Uh, and the Board of Education, I had spent the whole year protesting outdated traditions and arguing with them about Title IX because gender equality was important then. It's important to argue it with as much then as it is today. And I feel very strongly about that. Anyway, sorry, tangent. Um, but I found most of them to be pretty useless. So I hung up the phone with my teacher, and I could feel the burning feeling of defeat raising up through my stomach and out through my eyeballs. And then I noticed my dad, my sweet, uh, mild-mannered dad, was standing there in the kitchen and had witnessed the whole thing. And then he said something that shocked me. And he said, Maria, who cares about these people? When you get up on stage, say whatever the hell you want. Uh, it's, uh, it's your speech. What are they going to do, kick you out of school? So, so I got up on stage. Um, I, uh, so that's what I did. I wrote a fake speech. I rehearsed it for the principal. I didn't want them to tell me I couldn't speak at all. Uh, I felt bad lying. But uh, he was like, great, I'm glad we could have this conversation. And then when I got up on stage, I explained to the people what had happened over the past few days and how I'm going to say what I want to say because I'm nobody's puppet, and I read the original speech. Uh, my classmates cheered, uh, and then the next day, I showed up in the school library after project graduation uh, to collect my diploma, and it was mysteriously gone from the pile. Uh, so I went home. I uh, told my mom what had happened, flustered. She called the school, and the principal was withholding the diploma. Uh, newspapers picked up the story. Radio stations wanted interviews. Uh, all summer long, we fought with them for the diploma until um, eventually we, th we threatened them with the ACLU, and my diploma surprisingly just showed up in the mail one day. <laughs> but that's not the victory. Um, I learned a lot from that experience. Uh, I learned how to be true to yourself, how to take risks when you should take risks, and how to walk the walk. Uh, that speech opened up doors for me. It uh, led me to my first uh, internship at my local newspaper. They're like, Maria who? Oh, right, you? Yes, no problem. Uh, and a great career as a journalist. Um, I won a gazebo on The Price is Right with Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Barker, beautiful man, kissed him twice, uh, and donated it to Clifton High School, because I'm taking the high road. <laughs> if you want someone to remember you, you know, just give them a gazebo. That's what you should do. Um, but actually, over the past 10 years, that speech has paid off in a way I could never, ever have imagined. And I've been all over the world working with uh, philanthropists, government officials, executives, and CEOs. I write speeches. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Wow, keep it going for Maria. Woo! 
What was the inscription on the gazebo? That's what I got to know. <laughs> or just like Bob Barker was here. That'd be pretty good. Nice. Yes. That's a great dad. Oh, thank you. All right. We're going to keep it going. Russell Kahn, he is up next. Let's bring up Russell. Welcome. So everybody has a favorite book when they're growing up. For me, growing up in New York City, it was this book here, Hope for the Flowers. Somebody knows it. By Trina Paulus. The book just found me. I can't even explain it. I don't even know how it ended up in my possession. But it, I carried it with me through every transition in my life. I carried it with me to college. I took the book literally from childhood into adulthood. And then when I became grown up and I moved to Montclair, and that transition happened, I brought the book with me here. And I became the dad living in Montclair with a white fence and all that. I'm trying to adjust to that new world. And one afternoon, I'm, I'm pushing my kids down the street and near our neighborhood, and there's this giant butterfly tent filled with monarchs, like hundreds of them. There are kids playing inside, and the butterflies are crawling all over their faces. And outside of the tent is a table full of copies of this book. And I go, oh my gosh, I, I, I know this book. I love this book. And this little old lady sitting behind the table says, I, I wrote it. <laughs> and that's how I met Trina. And I told her how much the book had meant to me, how it, it taught me the meaning of life and love and inspired me to become a children's book author and kicked off a career in children's publishing. And we talked for a little while and then she signed a copy of her book and I brought it home and I read it to my kids that night. Now, I'll be honest, I still didn't feel at home in New Jersey, uh, but if Trina lived down the street, then maybe I was meant to be there. But as the weeks and months followed, uh, I made another transition in my life. I went from becoming a husband and a father to being a single dad. And I gotta be honest, I didn't quite know how to navigate it. I had to figure it out on my own a little bit. And that included figuring out what to do in New Jersey. Uh, I have no roots here. I, I, I didn't have family here. I didn't have friends here. I didn't even have a place to stay. I, and here I am, I have these kids and we would go bowling and we would go to diners and go hiking on Eagle, Eagle Rock Mountain. And, and I said, let's go visit our friend Trina Paulus. So I would walk over there and uh, we all had a picnic outside on her porch. And she showed the kids how to find monarch eggs on the milkweed that grew all over her property. We had a great day. And then I dropped the kids off and I said, okay, Trina, it's time for me to head home. She said, you don't have to go. If you want to stay here, you, you can. It's a big house here. I live all alone in Montclair. I've got five bedrooms. You can stay. That's, that's fine. I, I don't, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go home. I live in New, New York. That's where my life is. That's my career and my family and my... I started driving, and as soon as I hit Route 3, a massive headache overtook me, and I had no choice but to turn back. She was there, and she had a bed made in her son's old bedroom, and I stayed, fell asleep. Clearly, I needed a sanctuary. I had to crash. And I stayed for 18 months. I built a set of bunk beds in uh, one of Trina's bedrooms. We turned the third, third floor into a playroom, just full of cardboard creations, and we would just have fun. I think Trina loved having little kids running up and down her stairs again after all these years. For me, I got to tell you guys, I would wake up, I woke up, and I, I, Trina was reading her book to my kids on the couch. And here's the book that shaped who I became. It changed my life. It was the book that drove me as a child. And here she is reading it to my own kids. And this is my home. This is literally where I live. It, I still get goosebumps thinking about how this all happened. And I got to tell you, I, I don't know what spoke to me. What, what about the book spoke to me when I was nine years old? Maybe I liked the drawings. I, I don't know. But obviously, it's all about transformation, re rebirth. 
and finding yourself and becoming a butterfly, right? Um, I, you know, I ended up flying away uh, after 18 months. I moved into a three bedroom on Walnut Street and um, I fell in love with an amazing woman. We now uh, live in a house to down the street from Trina, actually. And uh, we're celebrating her 91st birthday tomorrow, actually. Um, it's really not how I would have drawn it up, um, but I'm so grateful to be here in Montclair in this community with my amazing kids and uh, the love of my life. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Russell. That was beautiful. Thank you. My daughter's a year and a half. She can say book, sort of. Um, we were on a road trip the other day. She likes to gnaw on them, so we don't give them books in the car. Um, but she found a little book of you know, my first presidents. And I thought it was incredibly ironic. I teach politics and government to high school students. And when we got back to our house, she had torn the cover off, making a clear statement on her political stance. She's not interested in politics, so I got to keep it moving with her. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep it going in here. Let's give it up for Catherine Kovacs. Welcome. So hi, everybody. I just want to say I really love that story. I really love that book. So, um, but my story is going to be about paper bags and plastic bags, so a little bit different. So um, this kind of occurred to me when I was in the grocery store the other day, and I had forgotten my tote bag again, and I didn't want to spend another $2. So I'm like walking out with my 10 items, sort of like a, like a, cheapskate robber and feeling cranky about the new legislation banning the bag. But then I thought, you know, it really is good for the environment. And, um, you know, I should be glad that I've lived long enough to see sort of the rise and the fall of the plastic bag. And that I actually, this is true, I had a little maybe something to do with it. Um, so the year is 1985. I'm about to graduate from Rutgers College. Go Rutgers, yay. Um, and uh, it's my last day of classes, and I had worked really like hard in school. So, I'm, by the way, I'm about the same age as Stephen Colbert, if you want to do the math. Anyway, um, so last day of classes, I had worked hard. I wasn't somebody who was like, oh, you know, I'm just going to kind of slip by. I don't need to study. I did, and I studied hard, and I worked. I, like, cleaned houses and all this. So this was, like, a big thing. So I'm out with my friends. We're in New Brunswick. We're, you know, walking up Easton Avenue to Queens Tavern, and then, boom, I'm hit by a car as a pedestrian. Thankfully, I wasn't seriously injured, but I did, um, I was banged up and I couldn't go to any of my second interviews and I was really disappointed. And the guy who hit me, the police officer said it was my fault. I think maybe he knew the driver, I don't know, but it was very disappointing and I had to go look for a job on my own. And this was like the summer of 85, it was like July, August, and I finally found a job and it was at the American Paper Institute. Yay, American Paper Institute. Everybody wants to work there, right? Trade Association of Paper Companies. So, uh, but you know, I was glad to have a job, but it was in the craft paper division. That's K-R-A-F-T, which is the German word for strength. And it's the, it's the brown paper that you make paper bags out of. So I had two basic responsibilities. One was to gather industry statistics on paper, craft paper production. And the other was to work um, with this PR agency, a Madison Avenue PR agency that that the paper companies hired to promote the paper bag over the plastic bag. Because you might not know this, but 80s, mid 80s, 85 was basically like the inflection point where it used to all be paper and then plastic was flooding because it was cheaper. And grocery stores operate on really thin margins. So it was driving like this big increase in plastic. But the paper companies were like, we're not gonna have this. We're gonna try to stop this from happening. But you know kind of probably how that turned out, but they tried. So one of the things that they decided was a great idea was let's have a, um, a contest and it will be on the Today Show, and this is true, for who is the best grocery bag packer in America. And so they somehow, I don't know how these people came from like Kansas and Minnesota to a Manhattan grocery store, and then they were judged on speed and sort of like organization, like, you know, are there too many cans, are the eggs on top, did you create a wall with the cereal boxes? And I got to be one of the judges. This is true. I got to be one of the judges, and I was on the Today Show for like 10 seconds. If anybody can find footage from 1986, like this is the Today Show of Hoda and Savannah. Back then, it was like Jane Pauley, for those of you who remember Jane Pauley and Brian Campbell. So like, that was pretty good, right? I had gone from like, ugh, 
this accident to, hey, I'm on the Today Show, but, you know, fame has a dark side. Don't they tell you that, right? You guys know this. Um, and, you know, I got to say, working in the Southern paper industry as a 21-year-old with Southern paper executives was like, you know, hashtag me too. Uh, I, I really did, you know, lots of humiliation, lots of feeling bad about myself, lots of crying, uh, at home, and I had decided then that I was like, I am going to go back to graduate school because, like, I can't, this is just not right. I, I don't want to be treated this way. I, I don't want to be disrespected. And I, I made the decision, and I told my boss, and I told this other paper company executive, and this guy, let's call him Les, because I think his name was Les, and he was from Georgia, and he, and I think he had genuine concern for me, and he was like, you do, you do know, darling, I have a bad Southern accent, you do know, darling, that, like, nobody's going to want to marry you if you go and get a graduate degree, no, nobody is going to want to marry you. And I was like, wow, it's like 1986 now. Like, it's not, like, women have the right to vote, but it really solidified my decision that, you know, I really, I need to go. I need to say bye to paper. Uh, and I did, and I was able to go to graduate school in Chicago. Great town, love Chicago. And um, actually found somebody who, was brave and such a revolutionary to marry someone who actually wanted to do that. Tom, he's there. Say hi. Um, so, so, uh, and also, I have to say, I'm glad the plastic bag is banned in ten states. I think that's good, right? It's, it's they exist in landfills for thousands of years, and so I consider it all a victory. And of course, the most important victory of all is that I do think things have improved for women. It's there's still a way to go for diversity and inclusion, but. You know, I do think we're making progress, and, um, and thank you. That's my story. Remember your tote bag, and have a good evening. All right. Thank you, Catherine. It's not an original thought, but I am that guy. There was a meme recently that I think I can go in. I perfectly calculated what I'm going to get in the store. I have exactly like, giant arms. I'm like, I got this. I'm, I'm good. I buy the tote bag. I have like 500 <sighs> but no plastic. I'm ready. Yes. All right, we're going to keep it going. Let's welcome to the stage, Labe Richman. Welcome. Good evening. Um, my name's Labe Richman, and I'm going to tell a story about my first lineup uh, in a precinct representing someone when I worked at Legal Aid. So I'm sitting in the legal aid library, and I'm with my client, and I call the detective who's involved in the case, and he tells me, look, we got your client. She's got to come down here for a lineup. She, let me tell you, counselor, it's a serious case. She was in line at a grocery store. There was a woman in front of her, and they had a dispute. And then she used her credit card, and then when this woman, who's a grandmother, was outside with a baby with her granddaughter, she pushes her down, pushes the stroller down, and the baby has a fractured skull. And I'm thinking, my client's a baby head basher? My mother told me not to take this job. So I am talk to my client about what happened, let's call her Regina, and I tell her the situation, and she looks at me, she's kind of a pretty, plump, light-skinned, African-American woman with beautiful skin, and most importantly, big, beautiful eyes that were now wet with tears. And she says, I, I mean, I was at that store but nothing happened. I don't know what she's talking about. So I say, well, let's go to the precinct. We have to. You're going to be arrested. Otherwise, let's see what happens. So we go down to the precinct. And as we're sitting in the office, a parade of, like, elderly women come in in, like, night nightgowns and pajamas, it looked like. And they have rouge on their faces. And I'm thinking, did they just bust the nursing home brothel? I, I, I don't know what's going on. So even worse, these were the fillers for the lineup. So I talked to the detective. I'm like, this isn't fair. My client is 24 years old. These, these fillers are older. 
they have darker skin, they're thinner, and it's like ridiculous. This can't be a fair lineup. And he's like, who's running this lineup, counselor, me or you? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I thought it was going to have a little input. And uh, he's like, yeah, right. So they start doing the lineup and they put the fillers in. And then the, the detective starts, he sees that there's a problem with the skin color. So he starts putting like makeup, like a powder on the fillers so that they look lighter. And they look like Betty, Betty Davison, you know, uh, what is Baby Jane movie. And then their rouge kind of stuck out, so they look like clown school rejects from the Golden Age Club. I mean, these were like really older people. So then the, the officer, I'll give him credit for this, he puts a sheet over all of the fillers and my client so that they can't see that they're wearing nightgowns and pajamas from the nursing home, and they're, they're holding this sheet up across their body. And I go into the viewing room and my client is sticking out like a sore thumb. I mean, she's just got this big, she's much more plump, she's got turgid cheeks. These people are kind of like this, the, the fillers have kind of empty smiles on their faces. And then the victim walks in to the viewing room. And I see my client sitting there, humiliated, stressed out with her hands on the sheet. And making it worse, a stream of tears comes down her cheek because of how she feels. So I'm like, oh my God, this is like, this is like a film. This is like a movie. I mean, the, the weirdness of that lineup was kind of like Fellini, or I felt like it was Diane Arbus taking a picture because it was so strange. And as those tears ran down her cheek, the victim said, I don't see her. She's not here. So I'm like, hey, let my people go. Come on. <laughs> and I walk out and I'm like, what the hell happened? That was like the most obvious, you know, it was obvious who was there. So I realized that what really happened was that this woman had dropped a baby. She's the grandmother. She wanted to take care of that baby, but her daughter and her son-in-law, you know, would not have let her babysit. So what she did was she said, oh, someone pushed me and I dropped the baby. And then she finds out, oh, the baby has a fractured skull. So of course she has to go to the cops. And her lie spiraled out of control. But in the end, she had to pick that woman out and she did the right thing. And that was a victory for my client. Thank you. Thank you, Lave. Just to put on your radar, if you need any non-skinny fillers in the future. I gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. Glad it came together for her. All right. We're going to keep it going. Let's welcome to the stage, Karen Corner. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Um... I was bullied uh, back in the 70s. I don't think they called it uh, bullying. I think it was character building or something like that. But it was the 70s in Catholic school. And it wasn't horrible like some of the stories today. Thank God there were no cell phones and things like that. But let's just call her Franny B. So Franny B would just do the usual like books off the desk elbows, pushes in the hallway when the teacher wasn't looking. And I wasn't the only victim of her torment, and that made me feel better. Um, but anyway, one day I find myself after school. And I was a good girl. I was there helping the teacher. So I was 
taking the erasers. Back then, no smart boards or anything. And I'm getting the chalk. I'm probably going to die of like chalk dust later on. But I look around. I'm by myself. The teacher left. I guess she went home. It was a different day and age back then. And it was a beautiful fall day. I remember the light was coming in the windows. It was Catholic school, right? So I'm like, wow. And my eyes fall on Franny B's desk. So I walk over and I start looking through her things. And back at that time, we didn't have lockers. So everything was there. Now I start looking in this one notebook that we wrote our hopes and our dreams. And the one thing Catholic school teaches you, and I know this because my kids were in Catholic school recently, is how to write. Very handy in the digital age. But there was this cursive writing. Never mastered it. But I'm looking through, and I'm expecting to see in Franny B's notebook pictures of the devil. I don't know. She was tormenting. But I saw this beautiful handwriting. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know, she torments us every day and then goes back and writes in beautiful handwriting about her hopes and dreams, and we're all scared to come to school. And it's pissing me off. So I look at the side, and there's a little art cubby, and there's some Elmer's glue. So I get the Elmer's glue, and I go to town with the Elmer's glue. Now I'm listening for the teacher, right? I'm alone. There is science textbooks. Matt, I'm like a shark feeding frenzy with the glue. I mean, it's out of control. And I just am like, oh, my gosh, I'm either going to go to hell or the devil's going to come. So I just put everything away, and I get the hell out of there, and I run home. And I'm feeling good until I realize that I have to go to school the next day. And Franny B is going to find out that I was there, and she's going to kill me. So I'm trying to think of how to get out of school. Now, this is before COVID, and my mom would, like, send me to school no matter what, right? If I broke my bone, she'd be like, okay, we'll go to the doctor after school. But somehow I manage. I'm not in school the next day. But the day comes where I have to come to school. And I'm just looking down at the ground, not making eye contact, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting for her to come get me. Lunchtime comes. Nothing happens. I'm like, okay, 3 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock. She's coming for me, right? I fly out the door. I'm running home. Nothing happens. The next day, the weirdest thing happens. Franny B is nice. Not just to me. I mean, she's not like Mother Teresa nice, but, but she's friendly. So I don't know if she had an epiphany that, wow, all the kids hate me and they glued my books together. But I know from that day on, she left me alone. And another victory was she left everybody else alone. And I became a teacher later on in life. And I see kids get bullied every day. And I am a person, small victories to help those kids. And that's my story. All right. Thank you, Karen. Nice job. <laughs> Clarifying question. When you open the cabinet, Elmer's glue, super glue? Did you make a nice choice? <laughs> I don't know if I would have done the same. That's beautiful. All right. We have only two more storytellers. I'm going to put this in your mind now. We do have space for one more. If there is somebody who's feeling impassioned, inspired by what they're hearing, who would be willing to tell a story after the next two, we would happily have you join us. Yeah. There is Montclair Film swag on the line, folks. <laughs> hey. All right. We might have a volunteer. All right, let's bring up our second to third to last now storyteller. Let's welcome Brandon Michael Maddox. All right, round of applause. I'm sorry, did you just say swag? I just want to point that out real quick. All right, I got ADD. I got to walk around. All right, so I recently just moved up here. I uh, am following a passion of acting, stand-up comedy, writing, and directing. But before I got to that point, 
uh, I was in high school and I was a loser. I was picked on. And I know you're thinking, oh, this strapping young guy up there, not him. But it happened to me a lot. I got picked on. It was pretty much from when I was very young all the way up to my freshman year. And what I decided to do was instead of letting them do it, why don't I just use it against them? And that's when my passion for stand-up came in. I always thought, you know, if I make them laugh, it'll hurt less when they hurt me. So when I started making them laugh, I found I was no longer their punching bag. I was in the class clown, which the students loved. The teachers hated it, but the students loved it. So I decided to go with it. And I said, that's what, that's what my passion is going to be. And I told my parents, I said, I want to go into acting and stand up. And they said, that's great, but what's a backup plan? And I did not have one. And I still don't. <laughs> They're thrilled. They love it. But I went around. I'm trying to find agents, managers, anyone to sign me. When I turned 17, I finally found a manager. And we signed the contract. And, you know, without, I didn't even read it over. So I was just happy to have representation. She did nothing for two years. I finally decided to go over the contract when I left her because one day I get a phone call saying she's left the industry, just disappeared. So I asked about my contract and they said, well, it's valid because, you know, it, there's no end date. I go, well, just get rid of it. They go, no, 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 but you signed with her. And I go, no, 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 we're getting rid of it. It wasn't a question. So I read over the contract and I realized, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, any representation takes a percentage of what you make. That is how they make their money. You don't pay them until you get paid. So I'm reading it over, and she knew I was a writer. And what I found out was she didn't take 15% of what I made. She owned 15% of me. Anything I wrote, anything I made, she had 15% credit on. She could change 15% of the project. And I didn't like that. So I, I voided the contract. I told them to get rid of it. About a year later, I finally find another manager. She goes, all right, well, I see you do a lot of acting and uh, writing now. I go, yeah. She goes, uh, do you mind if I get in on that? I said, no. And immediately canceled the meeting. We were done. I still don't have a manager or agent. But I figured if you want something done right, you do it yourself. So I'm searching all these acting and these uh, casting networks. I eventually found myself working on an HBO show, which is out. So I do that, and then I got a Showtime show. You know, this is just little stuff, extra work, background stuff. And then it's Amazon, and then it's, you know, the Netflix shows, and just little things coming every once in a while. And I remember when the first one came out, I showed my parents, and they were shocked. And they're like, oh, wait, you're really doing this? And I go, well, yeah, that's kind of what the last, you know, three or four years was for, but thanks for noticing now. So I then get a call from people from high school saying, hey, man, I'm watching this show, and I'm noticing you in the background. And I'm like, yeah. They're like, oh, well, let's hang out now. People who never gave the time of day in high school. Yeah. So immediately I go, no. I've gone down that path 100 times of being, you know, the person who just grabs the first bait. So I finally decided, no, I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm not going to do that. And very recently, I found myself opening up a production studio, producing my own work under my own banner. And then I get a call from my dad when I tell him all this. And he goes, well, good thing you didn't need that backup plan. I'm very happy with where I'm at. I mean, an Oscar soon wouldn't hurt anyone. But, you know, the same people who would pick on me and the same people who want to give the time of day are all of a sudden messaging me. Hey, you know, I've always thought about doing it. You tell anyone you're a comedian, the first thing is, well, people have told me I'm funny. You're not. <laughs> but these instances, these little things, you know, build up. I've been able to work with a lot of stand-up comedians. I've been able to just be around people who inspire me. And if there's anything I can give, there's a couple young people... I mean, everyone in the crowd is young. Is, if you have a passion for something, do it. 
just keep following it. There's nothing wrong with it. It might seem absurd. It might seem crazy. People thought I was crazy. A little bit I am. But there's no issue with that. And now I'm here two hours away from home and living 20 minutes from the city. And I couldn't genuinely be happier. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. Building your own luck. I love that. But also, don't you remember me? I was that guy from that thing. And Yeah? No? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll hang out. No, we won't. <laughs> All right. We have two more. We're going to keep it going. Let's get a round of applause. Let's bring up Amy DePaula. Hey, hello. I'm going to tell you a story about who I was before I fell down the stairs and who I became after I fell down the stairs. I refer to these stairs very proudly as my Carrie Bradshaw stairs. You know, like the character from Sex and the City. They reminded me of the uh, apartment that she lived in. Like her, I was living in a brownstone apartment. This one was in Boston, not in New York. And there were 17 cement stairs that went from the sidewalk to the front door. Like her, I was also a writer living alone in an apartment that she couldn't afford and I definitely couldn't afford. I ate a lot of uh, canned chili during this time period. But I would soon realize that I wasn't exactly the adult that I thought I was living in this apartment. Oh, and it was adult-like. I had my own little office where I could write my scripts there were two fire escapes, one out front where I could admire the tree-lined street and one out back where I could admire the buildings of the Back Bay of Boston. And what made me realize that I wasn't the adult I thought I was living in this apartment was my prized stairs. Because I, as I mentioned, I fell down them. But I have to be honest with you. I didn't exactly fall down them. I was pulled from behind in the dark by a hand that belonged to a face that I would never come to identify. It was the soul of a desperate man. And what I realized when I was pulled from these stairs is that I was unfocused, I was depressed, I was sad, I was a lost 28-year-old living in a city where I barely knew anyone. When I was pulled down the stairs, it felt like eternity. But it was really only a few seconds. I did manage to squeeze out a couple of thoughts during that time period. I wondered to myself, did I spend enough time with my nephews this year? I thought about that face of that guy that broke my heart that one time. I noticed that the light across the street on the building was shining brighter than it ever had before. I noticed and asked myself, did I just pee a little? I did. And lastly, I thought, is this how it ends? When I replay this moment in my head, it, it feels like a film, and no surprises here, I am also a filmmaker. I felt like I was being pulled through a tunnel, like a vortex, and when I landed on the other side, like Alice, I was faced with this new reality, one where I had to come to terms with the fact that I needed to be honest. I was a lost, lonely, depressed 28-year-old with an unfocused plan. And so after this fall, I started to never want to be alone at all. I started couch surfing. I was going on dates just to get out of the house and be dating. I was going to dinner every night with friends, out at bars, restaurants, forgetting why I was in Boston in the first place, and that was to go to grad school so I can get my MFA in film and make my parents happy that I chose to become a filmmaker. But something inside of me one day decided that I couldn't live like this anymore. I had to fill my time with something else, not just going out with friends, not going on endless dates for no reason. And I, I just decided to listen to one of those app dates who told me about this boxing gym. It was a dirty gym, too. It was in Southie, where they have the worst accents ever. It was charming in the way that, you know, you would look at, I don't know, a dive bar and say, yeah, let's have a drink in there. And as I started to go to this boxing gym, I was hooked. The first time I went in there, I hit the mitt so hard my knuckles bled. And as I kept going, I noticed changes in my life. I stopped dating just to date. I learned to love myself, which led me to meeting my husband finally. 
There weren't any cans of chili left in my cabinets. And I felt inspired again, so much so that I finally wrote a script that changed my life. And it was about a girl who was lost and lonely, who one day had the curiosity to walk into a boxing gym where she fought and fought and fought until she found herself. On the two-year anniversary of my attack, I stepped into my, the ring for my first fight ever. Almost down to the minute I was staring at my opponent, the minute that the man's hands pulled me off the stairs, I was charging forward. And although I didn't win that fight, it was on a technicality, I did win. Because I learned that in life, things that are good or bad don't happen to us. It's just that things happen to us and they make us the person we become. And this is how I became victorious. Yes, keep it going for Amy. Thank you. Wow. Things happen, and we decide if they're good or bad, how we use them. Thank you. That's beautiful. A very brave soul has decided to step into the ring. I'm going to follow Amy. I'm sorry. You're going to be great. Let's give a beautiful, warm welcome to Ilana Saltzman. Bring it on up here. Hi. Um, so when I was in first grade, um, I learned a few things. One, um, I became jaded. That was a good lesson. And um, two, I learned that the way to get ahead in life is to lie. Um, so I had this uh, purple belt when I got it. I got it in first grade, and it was the best belt I have ever seen in my whole life. My mom got it for me. It was purple. It had this really, re it was like such a, like a 90s belt. It had this cool flower in the middle of it with green and yellow and pink and purple. I was the coolest kid in first grade. Like if I knew the term the shit, that was me. Like I was a first grade influencer with that belt. So I put on that belt one day with my khakis and my purple shirt. And I was like, yeah, I'm hot. And so I went to school feeling so damn good. At recess, we played tag. So fun. I was slow, but so fun. And I ran around the blacktop. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, my God. I got to go to the bathroom. Like, I got to go. Like, time out. Time out. I got to go. So I start running to the bathroom. Like, no big deal, I'm gonna make it. And you know the feeling when you're running to the bathroom and the sensation just increases, like out of nowhere? So you're going, you're like, I gotta go, I gotta go. And it's like, oh my God, I really gotta go. And then you see the bathroom door and you're like, oh my God, like I really, really gotta go. And then you open the bathroom door and you're like, oh my God, it's going to come out of me right now. And then you open the stall and you're like, oh, if I don't pull down my pants right now, we are done, game over, it is lost. So I'm like, I, I'm, oh, I'm here, I'm in the stall. I like can barely close the stall. I'm like, this is my moment to shine. I look down. I'm wearing the damn purple belt and I don't know how to get it off. So I start, I start freaking out and I'm like, oh my God. So I'm fumbling with my thumbs. It was so confusing. It was like a latch. Like, I don't know. Are you dumb in first grade? Why didn't I know how to get this off? So I knew how to dress myself, just not get a belt off. So I'm trying to figure it out. I'm fumbling and fumbling my thumb. Everything's fumbling. And then one little drop pee slips out <laughs> and it felt so good. It just all came out in my khaki pants, and I'm looking at the toilet. I mean, I'm peeing myself with my belt on, with my khakis on, looking at the toilet going, I was so close. And the toilet's laughing at me. It's totally laughing at me. I hear it. And so I look down, I'm like, Okay, well, that sucks. <laughs> like, there's, I mean, a puddle on the floor. My light khakis turned into dark brown khakis. New fashion look, wasn't a fan. And I'm like, great. I either have to go to the nurse <laughs> or I lie. 
no big deal, I'll lie. I won't tell anyone that I just peed my pants. I'm thinking this is great. So I'm thinking like, how, what's the lie? What should I do? And I'm like, I got it. I got the perfect damn lie. I'm going to tell my friends I slipped in someone else's pee. It's genius. It's going to work. No one's going to know. Go outside, feeling confident, sloshing in my pants. I see my friends. They're like, oh, my God. What happened? You know, they're just waiting for someone to say, I peed my pants. I was the idiot that peed their pants. Mm -mm. I go, yeah, you ne never believe it. And I was cool because I was the coolest kid in the first grade with the belt. I was like, I just like this puddle of pee on the floor. And I like totally slipped on it. I fell in it. And can you believe some idiot first grader peed on that floor in the bathroom and I slipped in it? They were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I cannot believe you slipped on someone else's pee. So I succeeded. I never went to the nurse. I sat in that chair all day long. No one knew. I came home. My mom didn't know. No one knew. And that's when I learned when I lie, I can go very far. Thank you. All right. Keep it going for Alana. Thank you. <laughs> Fashion mishaps, as good a place to end as any. Let's give it one more time. A huge round of applause for all of our storytellers tonight. Our judges will need to retire to their secret lair for some deliberation, which means you all have a bathroom break, a chance to hit the snack bar one more time. We'll come back in about 10 minutes after they deliberate, and we'll hear who won our slam. Thank you, everyone. wiping their brows, they're ready to deliver. All right, I'd like to welcome up our judge, Holly. She's gonna deliver their final decisions. There will, yes, please. There will be Montclair film swag for all of our winners. And the number one story from tonight will also get a year's membership to Montclair film. Very exciting. All right, Holly, take it away. Um, thank you all. This is so fun. I have never been part of a story slam, let alone a judge for one. So getting to hear everyone's stories was such a treat. And I was looking forward to it every day. And I think we, we all were. But um, I, 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 we just have to applaud you guys on your, your bravery. And I think everyone was such awesome storytellers. Like you guys each had a, a different uh, sort of, of way about it. And it was just really great to get a glimpse into you know, somebody that we hadn't met before and, and really just learn a little bit. So thank you all for that. Um, we uh, really had a, a great time hearing from everybody and it was uh, a fun deliberation, but I think we uh, landed on our top three. So with that, um, in third place is Amy DePaula. We loved your story. Who's Amy? Amy. Woohoo! Cool. In second place, uh, Maria Del Pen. <laughs> Woo! Um, and then in first place, uh, Russell Kahn. Come on up. Did anyone else want to say anything? Uh, anyone else? No. Um, well, thank you guys. You were all awesome. All right. If you don't mind staying seated for just a moment, can we welcome back all of our storytellers? We want to do one large group picture so we can commemorate this beautiful evening. Thank you for your time and thank you for your stories.